I think we should start with, um, maybe we'll start with a Quranic verse. Huh? So we'd say, okay, the idea of turning towards the Lord of beauty, a related verse would be, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ أَلَوْهَا وَسِئُونَ Alim. You guys all know this verse, huh? To Allah belongs the east and the west. And in any direction that you turn, there is the face of Allah. So we start with this line, huh? But I have, John, you know this verse, yeah? Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's a very beautiful verse, don't you? Yes. Because um, the word used is um, wajhullah, so the idea of the aspect or the face of God. And normally, um, I think people would have trouble, theologians would have trouble this idea that um, they don't have trouble necessarily so much with God having a hand or something, because this is more clear in the Quran, but they do. Uh, and the Sufis love the idea that God has these aspects, which of course are the divine names. So, uh, so the idea is uh, the east and the west will, I guess, if you were uh, looking to the east or the west, you might be facing north, or you might be facing south, you see? And the east and the west in, in um, Islamic thought um, very often has the idea of, of um, azal and abad, so the source of things is the sunrise, and the the end of things is the sunset. For example, yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't mean one is necessarily looking specifically at the east or west. It means that one is grasping that in any direction, therefore, because because it's not just about space, it's about time, it's about everything in the domain of what can be known. This is the face of God. You see, so. Um, so if we, if we think about that verse for a minute, and what I'd like to do is read to you a passage from um, a commentary from Ibn Arabi's Fusus al-Hikam in the chapter Hud. At the end, near the end of that chapter, he's quoting this verse. Sheikh Ibn Arabi is quoting the verse, but we have the Sufi who is living in Herat, Afghanistan. He is from north of Afghanistan, from Khwarazm, and his name is Khwarazmi, not surprisingly. So I'm going to read his commentary about this verse and the meaning that he gives to it and then you will, we will get a little bit more insight. So uh, there's two paragraphs. I'll read one, translate it, and then read the next one and translate it. So about that verse. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَخْرِبُ فَأَيْنَا مَا تُوَلُوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ أَلَوْهَا وَاسِئُنْ عَلِيمٌ يعني Haq ta'ala zikr kard, yani farmud ke bahar jihat ke rui arid wajhu la dar an jihat zahir wa mutajalis. Wa az wajh e shayin haqiqat an shayin maradas. Pas haqiqat haq در همه جهت و همه جا باشد. So he says, um, in other words, the true reality, the Haq, God, uh, has said, has um, brought into your consideration and memory that um, in every direction that you might turn your own face, 
there is the face of God or the aspect of God. And in that direction, God is apparent and is in the process of unveiling, showing himself, using here the same root word that was used for, used for Moses when he asked God to show him, Tajala. Huh? He goes on to say that the, the wajha, the, the aspect or the face of a thing, what is meant by that is the reality of that thing. In a more amusing way, Ibn Arabi talks about Wajha in another place in the Futuhat, where he says, if you are traveling along a road and you see a corpse without a head, you see most of that person, but you don't know who it is. On the other hand, if you travel down the road and you find the severed head, you actually do know who it is. So he's trying to point out sort of the centrality of this idea of the face. And that's what he's saying here again, the reality of the thing, the inner meaning of the thing. So we have surat and mano. And, and so already what he's implying is if you are looking east and west, you're obviously seeing the form, are you not? You're seeing the surat. But he's saying you're trying to learn the, to find the mano, okay? The meaning the spiritual meaning, the inner meaning that is behind the form. Second paragraph, Khwarazmi, again commenting on Ibn Arabi's passage in Hud of the Fusus al-Hikam, Khwarazmi says, Wa ba'in oyat tanbi e kulube orefon namut to as hak wa ujuhe esmoi on hazrat dar hale eshtegal ba awarez hayat dunya ghafil nashavand balke dar hayat dunya Niz mushahede haq wa wujuhi esmoye on hazrat bashand ta dar jamiye ahwal o awqat ba haq buda bashand wa az on hazrat mahjub nagardand He says and this verse from the Quran it is giving a teaching and a warning um, to the hearts of the Gnostics, the people who know the inner meaning, so that they will not become unaware, they will not become heedless of the haq or all of the aspects of the haq in the divine names of that presence. Despite their states and conditions of being absorbed in the accidental things, meaning the events and the things in the world, on the contrary, during this life of this world, they will also witness the Haq and his aspects in the divine names. So that in every state and in every moment they are aware and they do not become veiled from the presence of the Haq. So this is what um, Khorazmi has to say uh, about this Quranic verse. It's a very typical Sufi 
approach to not only understanding what one should do, but how to do it and how to understand what the Quran is trying to say. What is the Quran actually trying to say to you? So he's giving a verse in the Quran and he's saying, here's what the verse is, and it's a magnificent verse. It's a very well-known verse in the Quran. Most people have memorized it, but what does it actually mean? And what he's saying, um, meaning not only Khwarazmi, but what the verse is saying, according to Khwarazmi, is that you're being told not to abandon the world, number one. Much of the Quran, people may get the impression you're supposed to completely abandon the world. This verse makes it very clear that anywhere you look, you would be seeing the face of God. So one should ask the question, do I see the face of God anywhere I look? If I don't see the face of God, are there, are there perhaps instances where I see the face of God? Um, how many people have seen the face of God in a child? See, some people have seen the face of God in a child. How many people have seen the face of God in nature? See? Just as many hands. People will see the face of God um, in their beloved, whatever their beloved is, they will see the face of God, you see? So, this is a valuable verse from Qur'an. And when you say these verses from Qur'an, you're trying to remember how the Sufis have given you further information about how to use the verse in Qur'an. That you should use the verse. So you say it in your prayer, and you try to use this verse. And sometimes at the end, when I'm saying salam, to the angels, I'm also thinking that I'm turning to the east and the west, you see? So when you, when you think about everything you're seeing around you, this is um, the face of God, okay? And um, now, um, does, is there any danger to not being able to see the face of God? Well, uh, there's a verse that we might want to look at together, another verse of Qur'an. And um, God says, um, وَمَنْ قَانَا فِي هَزِهِ عَمَانْ فَهُوَ فِي الْأَخِرَةِ عَمَانْ وَأَدَلُ سَبِيل Do you guys know this verse? What does it mean? Um, whoever sees my face in this world, they will see it in the other world. Whoever is blind, huh? Blind. Whoever is blind in this world will be blind in the next world. and is more lost than, sometimes translated more lost than anyone else, or I would translate it as more lost than he or she has ever been. So there's this, so there are these verses of the Quran, we'll call them severe, we'll call them um, worrisome, worrisome verses in the Quran. Now some people think worrisome verses is, you know, walking over the, gates of hell or whatever it is, but I think this is a more worrisome verse because it's actually asking you whether you did something fundamental, which is to learn to see in this world, see in the special sense, see? I'm remembering a poem, uh, and, and Faisal probably can help me if I forgot some of it, but when, when Ustad, uh, God bless him, when he passed away, I came to the mosque and I wrote on the blackboard a poem for you. Does you guys remember this poem? Because it's related to what we're talking about now. It's from Rumi. It's a poem from Rumi. 
Can Maybe if I start it. Do you, do you know about it? About the color? Yes. Yeah. You know this poem? Yeah. If you wish, I can start it and you can, you can, if I make a mistake, you tell me, okay? So he says, um, آن که کرد او در روح خوبانت دن نور خوشید است از شیشه سرنگ شیشه های رنگ رنگ آن نور را می نماید این چنین رنگین به ما چو نماند شیشه های رنگ رنگ نور بی رنگت کند اونگاه دنگ خوی کن به شیشه دیدن نور را تا چو شیشه بشکند نبود اما Now in this poem what is a word that is similar to the verse that I said to you? Quranic verse. There's one word, the same word. Uh -huh. Amon. What does that mean? Blind, huh? So what does the poem mean? It's a very interesting poem. It has very, even for Persian speaker, a little bit odd grammar, a little bit difficult. Um, but um, he says, um, that which um, has caused you to become astonished in the faces of the beautiful ones is not other than the light or the beams of the sun as they appear coming through the three colored glass. See? Multicolored glass. Uh, what shall we attribute the three colors to, since they are actually qualities? There's a lot of opinions about this, but what's clear to me is that this involves the usual way that we perceive things. And, and the most common thing, we are going to perceive them through the senses that we have. So this is in the world of senses. Some of the commentaries, they say, well, this is because it's the intellect, or the nafs, or this or this. but it is the, the human nature, let's put it this way, in its manifestations, but a simple way you might think of it for now is to keep it in the domain of the senses. And to say you really know about the beloved through seeing the beloved, through hearing the beloved, and, and the other uh, important faculty that is receptive is not speech. It is the sense of smell, the one that gave sight back to Jacob. So you would, you would be perceiving the beloved, like imagine you see a rose and it is, and you hear the bulbul. Bul. Isn't this standard image of Sufism? You, you hear the bird singing and you see the rose and, and you smell the rose and you look at the bulbul bul, and the bulbul bul is singing to the rose and the bulbul bul is saying, uh, I, am, I am actually getting drunk from the fragrance of the rose. You see, the bulbul is, is if, you, if you were to touch, let's say you were to transition to another sense, you were to touch the rose petal, wouldn't it be the most delicate thing? Like, is there any skin that feels like the rose petal? See, the rose petal is so delicate. So, it, so you see the meaning. So it could either be, it's from the senses, in other words, but there's something deeper than the senses, which is the direct perception of God, in other words. So, so again, the topic tonight is turning toward. There's a kind of, in Sufism, there's an idea of turning towards something, huh? Tawab. Turning towards the Lord of Beauty. Why the Lord of Beauty? Why not the Lord of Might or some other Lord? Because the Lord of Beauty is the most graceful Burak. Huh? So, so uh, Rahaf earlier asked about what is Burak, and I'm saying to you, the most perfect Burak is the Lord of Beauty. Because the Lord of Beauty only has um, 
the accoutrements and, and equipment and ornamentation from the, the names of beauty. So the divine names there are divided in majesty and beauty and you are much better to hitch a ride with the names of beauty. So if you can, you should try to hitch a ride with the names of beauty. So, um, so again, what you want to do is um, to, to think about this poem, and again, I'm gonna try in English to give you a summary, is that he's saying, that which has caused astonishment for you in the beauty of those who are beautiful. It is the radiance of the sun shining through the multicolored glass. It is the multicolored glass that has made this light seem to be of these three colors. When this glass is no longer there, you will be extremely astonished by the pure light itself. You had better cultivate the nature and the habit of being able to see the pure light so that when the glasses are broken, you will not find yourself blind. Okay, this is what this poem means. And I'm connecting this poem, famous poem uh, by Rumi, or stanza of poetry. Uh, the word here, that's an unusual word maybe in Persian, but it dang means astonishment, huh? to be surprised, to be uh, put into ecstasy, to become astonished, you see. And um, the, the, um, the imagery of the, of the multicolored glass is found here and there throughout the Masnavi, and it usually means some quality of perception. So if you remember the translation I've done of the light of the eyes comes from the light of the heart, and the light of the heart comes from the light of God. If you go back and read that, you'll see there also they're talking about the, the human perceptions. And so, uh, so the, clearly, if we think about this poem and the, the verse of um, whichever way you turn, there is the face of God, I think you understand that in that verse, you're trying to learn to see God whichever way you turn. So you're trying to transcend what you're seeing, whether it's desert, uh, in this case, almost anything. You're seeing a fire approaching you, you're seeing, but again, you're trying to use this in the sense of trying to see the beauty in what you're looking at around you, okay? And um, now, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, Sabia John, you have a question? When God, when, when God breaks the glass, so when he, when he means, what Rumi means is, um, so he's saying, you know, when he says, um, So the commentary means that it's, it's related to the verse in the Quran, um, it's, it's dangerous, yeah? It's, you, you get the feeling like it's, uh, 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 whoever is blind in this world, they will be blind in the next world, and they will be more lost than ever. They will be among the most lost of the people. This is a scary idea that you're already, do you feel like you're seeing, uh, already is scary enough in this world. Imagine if it's even worse in the next world, you see. It doesn't, it, it's, it's not a threat. It, it's, a, it, it's a statement of invitation. It's an invitation. Because it doesn't mean a person couldn't 
find salvation in the next world. It just means that if they arrive in that state at that time they will be blind and they will be very lost in that state. So it is about this life and the next life. But it can also be about fana and baka. So it could be that God breaks the glass for you in this life. You see what I'm saying? But at the very least, you are cultivating the ability to detach from the colored glass and you're developing the capacity to see the pure light and, and, be, and become very drunk off of that. Okay? Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Faisal. Yeah, I think absolutely. The, uh, um, as you say, Prophet he's saying to God, show me things as they truly are because he understands that things are metaphorical because we have to make a transition there's our understanding of language for us metaphor means that a word or a sentence has come to to represent something in the world of the divine, metaphorical means what for here appears to us to be concrete. This is metaphorical. And therefore, this is metaphorical. I am metaphorical, and I don't realize that I am metaphorical. What I see is metaphorical. So how can I see things as they really are? They would, I would have to see that things are either shadows, that are throwing shapes, which are metaphorical, or things are, um, they are embodiments, actually. Embodiments for what? For the divine names. So God says uh, in the Quran and in the verses of the poets that um, I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known. And I created this world so I would be known, as in reflected therein. And so therefore the divine names are manifesting therein, they're seen there. And so the absolutely, uh, um, and, and, and uh, Prophet Muhammad show me things the way they really are and increase my knowledge, meaning, meaning valuable knowledge. Rabbi Zedni Ilman, increase my knowledge of things and this knowledge is uh, a special knowledge of, of how things really are, you see? And Sufis say, Mutu qablan tamutu. Like, die before you die. Like, wouldn't it be better that you die first? You see? And, and, and you could. So, but, but remember, fana is not something we make happen. Um, dying is not something we make happen. Now, a person say, oh, yes, it is. I have this gun here, and I'm going to shoot myself in the hand. I'm going to make it happen. We say, no, you still don't understand. You still didn't make it happen. You see? So whether it is fana here or whether it is fana at the time of physical death, we, we, we are passengers. We are on a large river winding its way through time, and we are floating on the surface of this time of existence, you see, so we come in and out of time, whichever wish one you wish. Of course, it's much better. In fact, arguably, the poem is about finding your way to fana and then entering baka, when he says huikon, uh, it becomes part of your nature. It doesn't just become your habit, because hui, as you know, it really means it's part of your natural temperament. It implies that the element of the time after fana, that you now are no longer blind, agreed? So if you are, if you are still not in fana, you are still blind from this point of view, agreed? So, so yes, we are, we are looking. So the idea of fana means uh, extinction, extinction of those very colored glasses meaning the senses, the, the way we had constructed the world 
through those, the sensory apparatus, sight, hearing, smelling, feeling, interpreting, could, it could, you could move into other senses, the imagination, thought, depends how you wish to understand the glass of different colors. So the tajalla is broken glass or still glass? The, the uh, tajalla? Yeah. Well, now tajalla we have in the, in the other verse, and remember, the tajalla is, we would call it, um, let's switch the, let's switch it around a little bit, and we'd say for Fana it would be the Tajali Ahadi. So Tajali is God's manifestation. So imagine there's a room full of shadows. And if the if if the if the light is a bolt of lightning, or it's a sudden all the lights are turned on, I think you'll agree the shadows are gone. But if the light is um, on a rheostat and it's just turned down a little bit then the shadows are fading a little bit, agreed? But remember in this poem here, uh, where is he using the word uh, tajalo? He's using it in um, the story of Moses, is he not? You see? So the basis of use of this word goes back to the Quran again, right? Rabuhu. Kala Rabbi Arani Anzur Aleka. Kala Lantarani Loken Enzur Elol Jabale. Va Enistakara Makona Hu, Va Saufatarani. Falamo Tajala Rabahu, Rabuhu Lil Jabale, Jalahu Dakan. Wahara Musa Saeka Walama Afaka Kala Subhanaka Tubitu Eleka Wa Anna Awal al Mu'minin. This is the central verse, and if you're going to memorize one Quranic verse, it's a bit long, but I recommend you memorize it. Because uh, then you can have dreams about it. You can have. Uh, it fills you up, you see. Uh, and when Moses came to the place of the rendezvous, the place of the meeting, <clears throat> and his Lord was speaking to him, and he said, show yourself to me. His Lord said, you cannot see me. But look over here at this mountain. If it is able to stay in place and sustain the sight of me, then you also will be able to see me. At that moment, the Lord showed his tajali. See, that's where we get this word. To the mountain. The mountain was turned to dust. Moses fell into a swoon and was unconscious. When Moses came back to himself, he said, Glory be to you, to thee. And I turn to you, and I among the foremost of the believers, of the faithful, Mu'minin. You see? So there's a very important verse because when we're trying to understand this word, it is not a philosophical word, it's in Quran, and it and it and again we are in an imaginal world, because I said earlier, for God the divine names are for us the words are like words, like they have to do with what we learn in school, we learn how to write, we learn how to imagine uh, symbolism, metaphor, analogy, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. For God this is symbolism. This is symbolism, an analogy, you see? And, and so if you, so think of what that now means if you saw a beautiful person or a beautiful child or a beautiful rose. Do you understand? 
you realize this is a metaphor. Whose metaphor? Only God's metaphor. And, and uh, isn't it true that God has a lot of uh, fasahat? He's the most eloquent. He has a lot of eloquence, you see. So he's the most eloquent. He said, uh, he said my eloquence, it covers from the east to the west from the brightness of the light of the east to the darkness of the night of the west. In this case, the, the glasses would be the way that we see. So we see the rose with these eyes. We see, we smell the rose with this nose. We hear the bulbul, the bird, singing to the rose with these ears. We hear maybe the morning wind bringing fragrance. As I've explained to you, what happens is that your perception moves from these glasses. It moves to what's called the heart. See? So perception moves, literally moves to this part of the body. According to the Quran and according to our experience, according to our experience, a window opens, a, a a seeing opens. What is he talking about in Quran? He means a seeing of basirat, yeah? What does he mean by blind? He doesn't mean blind here because your eyes are rotting or being cremated or being whatever after you die. But the point is the, the, the seeing cannot possibly be these eyes of Crete. So the seeing he's talking about in the Quran is a seeing that is permanent, is coming from his seeing, his seeing.